talking with Professor Derek Smith from the University of Cambridge in the UK, an old friend of mine. Hey, Derek. Hey, Vincent. How are you? Finally caught up with you after trying for two years to get you on yeah. TWIP. It's been a while. Derek spoke today, just in a past session, about a really neat technique he developed called antigenic cartography. I want to explore that a little with you today because our listeners would love to hear it. But it's based on getting a lot of samples. And That's right. I think you mentioned how the World Health Organization is involved in that. How does that work? Yeah, there's in <clears throat> when the influenza vaccine was, was first made, um, it worked great for a few years and then it stopped working. And the reason was is because, and this was in the 40s and the 50s, the virus had evolved. So the virus, the strain of flu that was used in the vaccine was updated. And then a couple of years later, vaccine stopped working well again. And about 50 years ago now, the World Health, Health Organization instigated something called the Global Influenza Surveillance Network. Mm -hmm. And this is thousands of people around the world who take samples from people who have flu. Those samples are sent to one of over 100 national influenza, influenza laboratories around the world, where they're tested to see what type of flu they are and, and sort of details about how the viruses have evolved. And those samples are also sent to one of four international collaborating centers on flu, also WHO centers, either in Australia, Japan, the UK, or the US. And there they're analyzed in great detail. Depending on how much flu there is in a particular season, there might be anything between 10 and 20,000 strains that are analyzed this way each wow. year. Globally. Globally, that's right. Is that's it right. all influenza A or also influenza also inf B? Also influenza B. That's right. And they, there is a committee that oversees the results, and you're, you're part of that committee? Yes, is that's that right. Yeah, the committee that selects the strains of flu that go in the influenza vaccine. So this committee meets twice a year mm -hmm. to decide whether or not to update, update the vaccine strains. Are they always right? <laughs> they always do a really good job. <laughs> and the times when... But, but there is a risk, because that committee meets about a year in advance mm -hmm. of when there will actually be a flu season. It has to meet sufficiently in advance because there's now about 300 million doses of vaccine that are produced and that, that vaccine has to be made and tested, distributed, people vaccinated. So a lot rides on this global network. It's a, hu it's a hugely important decision and, and yeah. Um, but what can happen is occasionally the virus evolves mm -hmm. during that period from when the decision is made until when, until right. when, until when the vaccine is used. Um, there are three different strains of flu that are in the vaccine, one against H1, one against mm -hmm. H3, and one against, and one against B. Um, occasionally, one of those components might not be a perfect anti antigenic match. Even when it's not a perfect antigenic match, it still protects people, vulnerable people, against mm -hmm. hospitalization, is uh, what right. the data says. So what, what data do you use to try and predict whether a particular strain is going to be the one that you should immunize against. Yeah, what, what's, so there's, there's a number of different pieces of data that are used. Mm -hmm. There's genetic data, there's epidemiological data, there's human serology data. The most critical data are these detailed so-called antigenic analyses of the data. That this indicates, this is the data that tells us how far the strains of flu have evolved in, in the sense of how our immune systems will see mm -hmm. that difference. So this is the critical thing for deciding what strains of flu should be in the vaccine. So these involve hemagglutination inhibition or HI tests? That's exactly we call right. Them. That's so exactly we right. have talked about this on TWIV before, so right. some of our yeah, listen, right. listeners will be familiar with it. Yep. Yep. So it, essentially, if you find a new strain that's prevalent in a particular region, yep. and that's distant enough from the previous season's virus, Yes. You decide to use that. How, how much different does it have to be in terms of this HI test? Yeah. Um, so as w it can't just be different in one particular region. It has to be different and, and it looks like it's going to spread around the world because what we're really trying to do is we're trying to estimate um, when, what strains are going to be circulating mm -hmm. about a year from when the choice is made. And as I say, you know, this, is, this is typically done very well and very accurately. How, how do you know if it's going to spread, though? Um, a lot of historical um, information about how things have spread before. In fact, there was a very nice study that was published in 2008 in Science um, with um, people throughout the WHO Collaborating Center Network where they found out that for the H3 viruses, 
that every year these viruses, um, well, they are continually circulating in East and Southeast Asia. And every year the viruses that, are, that we get in the rest of the world are the viruses that are circulating in East and Southeast Asia. So this is a particularly important place mm -hmm. to look every year for the H3 viruses. Mm -hmm. So your technique of antigenic cartography taps into the, these type of data, the, the serology yeah, that we're talking right. about. So can you explain it to us? Yeah. So these data have been studied for many years in this in a tabular form. You know, tables of data of viruses that have been tested, as I say, thousands of viruses that have been tested against, you know, somewhere typically between about eight and sixteen different different mm -hmm. antisera. These data in a good laboratory, they're very, they are very repeatable data um, and they are highly quantitative data. However, they're difficult to understand for anybody but just a very few number of experts in the world that somehow seem to be able to make these things we call antigenic maps in their heads from looking at the, at the mm -hmm. tabular data. What antigenic cartography does, it takes that tabular data and does some mathematical and computational techniques. It's absolutely not rocket science, it's pretty straightforward. And converts it into something we call an antigenic map, which is a visual representation of that data. It's a similar sort of thing if you look, for example, in the back of a road atlas, there'll be, mm -hmm. typically see a table there that tells you how many miles or how many kilometers it is between different cities. It's very easy to imagine that if you already have a map of, let's say, the United States, you can easily generate that, that, that distance matrix, mm -hmm. what a mathematician would call that, that table of miles between cities. It turns out that it's a pretty easy thing to do computationally and mathematically to take that distance matrix and mm -hmm. reconstruct the map of the, of the US, or, or more specifically to right. reconstruct the relative positions of the cities. What antigenic cartography does is it takes an HI table, this table of data for how antibodies um, react with different viruses, and it constructs something we call an antigenic map, which looks a little bit like, like a geographic map. But instead of having all the things we usually see in a geographic map, what it has are antigens, the different strains in this case of influenza virus, and antisera, the antisera that have been mm -hmm. used, that they've been measured against. And we can see, depending on how the strains are clustered, um, how related those strains are to each other. So the closer that strains are to each other in an antigenic map, the more similar they are to each other antigenically, and thus uh, how well a vaccine strain um, that is in the center of a cluster of viruses mm -hmm. will be protective against, the, against, against those viruses. So in your talk today, you showed some of these maps. Yes. And you showed in particular a lot of data for the H3N2 viruses. That's right. Which arose in 1968. That's right. And are still circulating. They're still right? circulating today. And you showed a cluster of spots of one color, yes. red spots, and then purple spots quite yes. a distance away, then green yes. spots, yes. and you called them clusters. That's right. So what does that mean? Um, well, it turns out that influenza viruses, the viruses, the H3 viruses that are circulating globally, typically tend to be very related to each other. So there are thousands of strains that are analyzed mm -hmm. in any particular year somewhere between 5 and 20% of the world's population gets flu, which means that there's maybe something like a billion people who get infected with flu every year. Mm -hmm. All of the data indicate that these strains are, tend to all be pretty similar to each other. They tend to be in a cluster, antigenically. Mm -hmm. It's really pretty fortunate that they are, because the fact that they are means that we can choose one vaccine strain, a representative strain of that cluster, and it will protect against okay. all these so people. So the viruses within a flu. cluster are all protected by a single vaccine. That's right. Okay. That's right. And then the way that the virus happens to evolve is it typically will form a new cluster of viruses mm -hmm. that's some distance away from the previous cluster and the old cluster will go extinct. And this has happened now something like 14 or 15 times since H3 entered the human population in 1968. And each time there's one of those cluster transitions it's when the vaccine needs to be updated. Now, you obtain these data after the fact, but could you predict <laughs> the next cluster that's going to arise? Yeah, well, as, we've, as, I mean, as you say, we've known each other for a while, and so you know that the primary thing that we do in our research in Cambridge, and also with colleagues at Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands and, and other people throughout the world, is to try to see how predictable this evolution mm -hmm. might be. You know, and 
course, it's never going to be, well, it's unlikely to be predictable many years down the road. Um, but if we could get that, if we could sort of move forward that prediction horizon to around about one year, we'd have tremendous impact for public health reasons because instead of doing this, these very good um, estimates of which mm -hmm. strains are going to be circulating a year later, you know, we would have a much better idea of what was actually going to happen. It's unlikely to ever be perfect in the same way as with weather forecasting. You know, today the weather forecast is pretty good sort of two or three days into the mm -hmm. future in most parts of the world, but it's never going to be 100% right. But if you can, well, you yes, know what sure, I mean. Sure, sure. Yeah. So there's, there's a couple of things. One's the prediction horizon in the sense of about how far in advance one can predict. And then the other issue is how, how accurately. Right. We don't know yet whether or not flu evolution or the evolution of any pathogen is going to be predictable at all. We have some indications that it is, which is why we're putting a lot of effort into it. But you know, until we actually figure it out, we won't know one way or the other. Can you apply the technique to other viruses as well, besides flu? Yes. Um, already published is the application to, to lyssa viruses. Rabies virus is, mm -hmm. a, is, a, is a lyssa virus. Um, to EV71 and to, um, to some, well, some more influenza viruses, CTL epitope, the T-cell response mm -hmm. to influenza virus. Um, there's also work going on on malaria. There's work about to start on dengue and HIV. So the method is a very general method, nothing specific at all about flu. Our strategy is a lot of deep investigations on flu because of all the antigenically variable pathogens, mm -hmm. it's really sort of the most simple of them mm -hmm. to try to hopefully you know, thoroughly thresh out the methods there, some un potentially thresh out some underlying principles there that can be applied in these more complex situations. I would think for HIV it would be hard because the variation occurs within an yeah, individual that's right. That's right. and you would have to have multiple samples of, yeah. of antibodies. Yeah, right? that's absolutely right. That's but it, absolutely would, but right. it would be interesting to look at that yeah. as well. So why did you develop this approach? Was it to be able to predict or just to see what had happened already? Well, I say that uh, necessity is the mother of invention and in the late 1990s I and colleagues were working on the repeated vaccination, the, the effect of repeatedly vaccinating individuals against influenza. Right. And we came up with some, um, some well, with an, with an underlying mechanism that we felt was applying when people are being vaccinated repeatedly mm -hmm. for some of the variation in efficacy that one is seen when that happens. And we wanted to test this method. We tested it on all the existing data. It looked like it, it looks like this particular mechanism held. So it was really time to think about applying this method in practice. And one of the things that we needed was to have high resolution information mm -hmm. about how the virus is evolving. Um, and so the data that we needed to look at, this phenotypic data, the antigenic data, was in these HI tables. And when one looks at these HI tables, as I say, they're very quantitative, but not well understood by almost everybody sure. because of these paradoxes or irregularities in the data that we talked about before. So Ron Frischet, Alan Lapides, and I set about trying to understand what these paradoxes were about. And hmm. in order to be able to have this high resolution quantitative assessment of, of these antigenic differences. And then it just grew into this monster sure. where we found out we could do all these other things with it as well. Is there a place where people can go to, to look at your maps and find yeah, out about them? There is. Um, if they go to uh, www.antigenic-cartography.org, there's information there about antigenic very cartography good. and we'd be very happy to see Excellent. them. I want to ask you one more question. Yep. I know you have to catch a plane to yep. go back home. Yep. One more question. What's going on with the pandemic H1N1 virus in terms of antigenic cartography? Um, well, the virus is so far not evolving antigenically from where it's been since mm -hmm. the pandemic started, of course, which is great news. It is, however, expected that it will evolve. It's, it's going to turn, almost certainly will turn into a regular seasonal influenza virus. And like we see with all other seasonal influenza mm -hmm. viruses in humans, there's going to come a time when the current antigenic cluster evolves into the next cluster. It's not something that the WHO network is seeing yet, but 
everybody's on the watch for it. And as I say, every six months, there's a new vaccine mm -hmm. decision that is made for whether the strain should be updated. In fact, in uh, the end of September, which is just in a week or so from now, um, the WHO, this committee will meet to decide mm -hmm. what the vaccine strain should be for the Southern Hemisphere winter. Of course, that's out of phase with the Northern Hemisphere right. winter. So that choice is made in September every year for the people in the Southern Hemisphere for to be vaccinated. For what would be our summer For next what year. would be our summer, that's exactly right. right. And given historical data, the change happens every one to three years, roughly, is that right? For H3, it's something like that. It can, it can be longer. Um, on average for H3 since 1968, it was four and a half years, mm -hmm. although some antigenic clusters, yeah, will last for just a single year. And what, what about the H1N1s that circulated from 77 till last year? What was the a little bit A little bit slower evolution, mm -hmm. antigenic evolution in the H1s. Yeah. Very good. Well, I, I think you're heading off to that meeting, uh, the WHO yep. meeting, very soon. That's right. Great. That's Sounds right. exciting. Thanks yeah. for talking with us. My pleasure. Appreciate good to it. talk to you. You guys. too, Derek. Take Bye. care. Good trip home. Thanks.